In Greek mythology, the Trojan War was waged against the city of Troy by the Achaeans Greeks after Paris of Troy took Helen from her husband Menelaus, king of Sparta. The war is one of the most important events in Greek mythology and has been narrated through many works of Greek literature, most notably Homer's Iliad. The core of the Iliad Books 2, 23 describes a period of four days and two nights in the tenth year of the decade-long siege of Troy, the Odyssey describes the journey home of Odysseus, one of the war's heroes. Other parts of the war are described in a cycle of epic poems, which have survived through fragments. Episodes from the war provided material for Greek tragedy and other works of Greek literature, and for Roman poets including Virgil and Ovid. The ancient Greeks believed that Troy was located near the Dardanelles and that the Trojan War was a historical event of the 13th or 12th century BC, but by the mid-19th century AD, both the war and the city were widely seen as non-historical. In 1868, however, the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann met Frank Galvet, who convinced Schliemann that Troy was a real city at what is now Hisalik in Turkey. On the basis of excavations conducted by Schliemann and others, this claim is now accepted by most scholars. Whether there is any historical reality behind the Trojan War remains an open question. Many scholars believe that there is a historical core to the tale, though this may simply mean that the Homeric stories are a fusion of various tales of sieges and expeditions by Mycenaean Greeks during the Bronze Age. Those who believe that the stories of the Trojan War are derived from a specific historical conflict usually dated to the 12th or 11th century BC, often preferring the dates given by Aratus Themes, 1194-1184 BC, which roughly correspond to archaeological evidence of a catastrophic burning of Troy 7, and the late Bronze Age collapse. The events of the Trojan War are found in many works of Greek literature and depicted in numerous works of Greek art. There is no single, authoritative text which tells the entire events of the war. Instead, the story is assembled from a variety of sources, some of which report contradictory versions of the events. The most important literary sources are the two epic poems traditionally credited to Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, composed sometime between the 9th and 6th centuries BC. Each poem narrates only a part of the war. The Iliad covers a short period in the last year of the siege of Troy, while the Odyssey concerns Odysseus's return to his home island of Ithaca following the sack of Troy and contains several flashbacks to particular episodes in the war. Other parts of the Trojan War were told in the poems of the epic cycle, also known as the cyclic epics, the Cypria, Aethiopus, Little Iliad, Iliopersus, Nostoi, and Telegony. Though these poems survive only in fragments, their content is known from a summary included in Proclus Crestomity. The authorship of the cyclic epics is uncertain. It is generally thought that the poems were written down in the 7th and 6th century BC, after the composition of the Homeric poems, though it is widely believed that they were based on earlier traditions. Both the Homeric epics and the epic cycle take origin from oral tradition. Even after the composition of the Iliad, Odyssey, and the cyclic epics, the myths of the Trojan War were passed on orally in many genres of poetry and through non-poetic storytelling. Events and details of the story that are only found in later authors may have been passed on through oral tradition and could be as old as the Homeric poems. Visual art, such as vase painting, was another medium in which myths of the Trojan War circulated. In later ages playwrights, historians, and other intellectuals would create works inspired by the Trojan War. The three great tragedians of Athens, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides wrote a number of dramas that portray episodes from the Trojan War. Among Roman writers the most important is the 1st century BC poet Virgil. In Book 2 of his Aeneid, Aeneas narrates the sack of Troy. Traditionally, the Trojan War arose from a sequence of events beginning with a quarrel between the goddesses Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Eris, the goddess of discord, was not invited to the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, and so arrived bearing a gift, a golden apple, inscribed, for the fairest. Each of the goddesses claimed to be the fairest, and the rightful owner of the apple. They submitted the judgment to a shepherd they encountered tending his flock. 
Each of the goddesses promised the young man a boon in return for his favor, power, wisdom, or love. The youth, in fact Paris, a Trojan prince who had been raised in the countryside, chose love, and awarded the apple to Aphrodite. As his reward, Aphrodite caused Helen, the queen of Sparta, and most beautiful of all women, to fall in love with Paris. But the judgment of Paris earned him the ire of both Hera and Athena, and when Helen left her husband, Menelaus, the Spartan king, for Paris of Troy, Menelaus called upon all the kings and princes of Greece to wage war upon Troy. Menelaus' brother Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, led an expedition of Achaean troops to Troy and besieged the city for ten years because of Paris' insult. After the deaths of many heroes, including the Achaeans Achilles and Ajax, and the Trojans Hector and Paris, the city fell to the ruse of the Trojan horse. The Achaeans slaughtered the Trojans, except for some of the women and children whom they kept as sold as slaves and desecrated the temples, thus earning the gods' wrath. Few of the Achaeans returned safely to their homes and many founded colonies in distant shores. The Romans later traced their origin to Aeneas, Aphrodite's son and one of the Trojans, who was said to have led the surviving Trojans to modern-day Italy. The following summary of the Trojan War follows the order of events as given in Proclus' summary, along with the Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid, supplemented with details drawn from other authors. Plan of Zeus According to Greek mythology, Zeus had become king of the gods by overthrowing his father Cronus, Cronus in turn had overthrown his father Uranus. Zeus was not faithful to his wife and sister Hera, and had many relationships from which many children were born. Since Zeus believed that there were too many people populating the earth, he envisioned Momus a Themis, who was to use the Trojan War as a means to depopulate the earth, especially of his demigod descendants. These can be supported by Hesiod's account, now all the gods were divided through strife, for at that very time Zeus who thunders on high was meditating marvelous deeds, even to mingle storm and tempest over the boundless earth, and already he was hastening to make an utter end of the race of mortal men, declaring that he would destroy the lives of the demigods, that the children of the gods should not meet with wretched mortals, seeing their fate with their own eyes. But that the blessed gods henceforth even as aforetime should have their living and their habitations apart from men. But on those who were born of immortals and of mankind verily Zeus laid toil and sorrow upon sorrow. Judgment of Paris Zeus came to learn from either Themis or Prometheus, after Heracles had released him from Caucasus, that, like his father Cronus, he would be overthrown by one of his sons. Another prophecy stated that a son of the sea nymph Thetis, with whom Zeus fell in love after gazing upon her in the oceans of the Greek coast, would become greater than his father. Possibly for one or both of these reasons, Thetis was betrothed to an elderly human king, Peleus son of Aeacus, either upon Zeus' orders, or because she wished to please Hera, who had raised her. All of the gods were invited to Peleus and Thetis' wedding and brought many gifts, except Eris the goddess of discord who was stopped at the door by Hermes, on Zeus' order. Insulted, she threw from the door a gift of her own, a golden apple to Melantes Eridos on which was inscribed the word Calisti Calisti to the fairest. The apple was claimed by Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. They quarreled bitterly over it, and none of the other gods would venture an opinion favoring one, for fear of earning the enmity of the other two. Eventually, Zeus ordered Hermes to lead the three goddesses to Paris, a prince of Troy, who, unaware of his ancestry, was being raised as a shepherd in Mount Ida, because of a prophecy that he would be the downfall of Troy. After bathing in the spring of Ida, the goddesses appeared to him naked, either for the sake of winning or at Paris' request. Paris was unable to decide among them, so the goddesses resorted to brides. Athena offered Paris wisdom, skill in battle, and the abilities of the greatest warriors, Hera offered him political power and control of all of Asia, and Aphrodite offered him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. Paris awarded the apple to Aphrodite, and, after several adventures, returned to Troy, where he was recognized by his royal family. Peleus and Thetis bore a son, whom they named Achilles. It was foretold that he would either die of old age after an uneventful life, 
or die young in a battlefield and gain immortality through poetry. Furthermore, when Achilles was nine years old, Calchas had prophesied that Troy could not again fall without his help. A number of sources credit Thetis with attempting to make Achilles immortal when he was an infant. Some of these state that she held him over fire every night to burn away his mortal parts and rubbed him with ambrosia during the day, but Peleus discovered her actions and stopped her. According to some versions of this story, Thetis had already killed several sons in this manner, and Peleus' action therefore saved his son's life. Other sources state that Thetis bathed Achilles in the Styx, the river that runs to the underworld, making him invulnerable wherever he was touched by the water. Because she had held him by the heel, it was not a must during the bathing and thus the heel remained mortal and vulnerable to injury, hence the expression, a chill's heel, for an isolated weakness. He grew up to be the greatest of all mortal warriors. After Calchas' prophecy, Thetis hid Achilles in Skyros at the court of King Lycomedes, where he was disguised as a girl. At a crucial point in the war, she assists her son by providing weapons divinely forged by her feastists. See below. The most beautiful woman in the world was Helen, one of the daughters of Tyndareus, king of Sparta. Her mother was Leda, who had been either raped or seduced by Zeus in the form of a swan. Accounts differ over which of Leda's four children, two pairs of twins, were fathered by Zeus and which by Tyndareus. However, Helen is usually credited as Zeus' daughter, and sometimes Nemesis is credited as her mother. Helen had scores of suitors, and her father was unwilling to choose one for fear the others would retaliate violently. Finally, one of the suitors, Odysseus of Ithaca, proposed a plan to solve the dilemma. In exchange for Tyndareus' support of his own suit towards Penelope, he suggested that Tyndareus require all of Helen's suitors to promise that they would defend the marriage of Helen, regardless of whom he chose. The suitors duly swore the required oath on the severed pieces of a horse, although not without a certain amount of grumbling. Tyndareus chose Menelaus. Menelaus was a political choice on her father's part. He had wealth and power. He had humbly not petitioned for her himself, but instead sent his brother Agamemnon on his behalf. He had promised Aphrodite a hecatomb, a sacrifice of one hundred oxen, if he won Helen, but forgot about it and earned her wrath. Menelaus inherited Tyndareus' throne of Sparta with Helen as his queen when her brothers, Castor and Pollux, became gods, and when Agamemnon married Helen's sister Clytemnestra and took back the throne of Mycenae. Paris, under the guise of a supposed diplomatic mission, went to Sparta to get Helen and bring her back to Troy. Before Helen could look up to see him enter the palace, she was shot with an arrow from Eros, otherwise known as Cupid, and fell in love with Paris when she saw him, as promised by Aphrodite. Menelaus had left for Crete to bury his uncle, Cretus. According to one account, Hera, still jealous over the judgment of Paris, sent a storm. The storm caused the lovers to land in Egypt, where the gods replaced Helen with the likeness of her maid of clouds, Nephal. The myth of Helen being switched is attributed to the 6th century BC Sicilian poet Stesichorus, while for Homer the Helen in Troy was one and the same. The ship then landed in Sidon. Paris, fearful of getting caught, spent some time there and then sailed to Troy. Paris' abduction of Helen had several precedents. Io was taken from Mycenae, Europa was taken from Phoenicia, Jason took Medea from Colchis, and the Trojan princess Hesion had been taken by Heracles, who gave her to Telamon of Salamis. According to Herodotus, Paris was emboldened by these examples to steal himself a wife from Greece, and expected no retribution, since there had been none in the other cases. Gathering of Achaean forces and the first expedition according to Homer, Menelaus and his ally, Odysseus, travelled to Troy, where they unsuccessfully sought to recover Helen by diplomatic means. Menelaus then asked Agamemnon to uphold his oath, which, as one of Helen's suitors, was to defend her marriage regardless of which suitor had been chosen. Agamemnon agreed and sent emissaries to all the Achaean kings and princes to call them to observe their oaths and retrieve Helen. Since Menelaus's wedding, Odysseus had married Penelope and fathered a son, Telemachus. In order to avoid the war, he feigned madness and sowed his fields with salt. 
Palamedes outwitted him by placing Telemachus, then an infant, in front of the plough's path. Odysseus turned aside, unwilling to kill his son, so revealing his sanity and forcing him to join the war. According to Homer, however, Odysseus supported the military adventure from the beginning and traveled the region with Pylos king, Nestor, to recruit forces. At Skyros, Achilles had an affair with the king's daughter Didymia, resulting in a child, Neoptolemus. Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Achilles' tutor Phoenix went to retrieve Achilles. Achilles' mother disguised him as a woman so that he would not have to go to war, but, according to one story, they blew a horn, and Achilles revealed himself by seizing a spear to fight intruders, rather than fleeing. According to another story, they disguised themselves as merchants bearing trinkets and weaponry, and Achilles was marked out from the other women for admiring weaponry instead of clothes and jewelry. Pausanias said that, according to Homer, Achilles did not hide in Skyros, but rather conquered the island, as part of the Trojan War. First gathering at Aulis the Achaean forces first gathered at Aulis. All the suitors sent their forces except King Sinras of Cyprus. Though he sent breastplates to Agamemnon and promised to send fifty ships, he sent only one real ship, led by the son of Migdalian, and forty-nine ships made of clay. Idomeneus was willing to lead the Cretan contingent in Mycenae's war against Troy, but only as a co-commander, which he was granted. The last commander to arrive was Achilles, who was then fifteen years old. Following a sacrifice to Apollo, a snake slithered from the altar to a sparrow's nest in a plane tree nearby. It ate the mother and her nine chicks, then was turned to stone. Calchas interpreted this as a sign that Troy would fall in the tenth year of the war. Telephus when the Achaeans left for the war, they did not know the way, and accidentally landed in Mysia, ruled by King Telephus, son of Heracles, who had led a contingent of Arcadians to settle there. In the battle, Achilles wounded Telephus, who had killed Thusander. Because the wound would not heal, Telephus asked an oracle, what will happen to the wound? The oracle responded, he that wounded shall heal. The Achaean fleet then set sail and was scattered by a storm. Achilles landed in Skyros and married Didymia. A new gathering was set again in Aulis. Telephus went to Aulis, and either pretended to be a beggar, asking Agamemnon to help heal his wound, or kidnapped Orestes and held him for ransom, demanding the wound be healed. Achilles refused, claiming to have no medical knowledge. Odysseus reasoned that the spear that had inflicted the wound must be able to heal it. Pieces of the spear were scraped off onto the wound, and Telephus was healed. Telephus then showed the Achaeans the route to Troy. Some scholars have regarded the expedition against Telephus and its resolution as a derivative reworking of elements from the main story of the Trojan War, but it has also been seen as fitting the story pattern of the preliminary adventure that anticipates events and themes from the main narrative, and therefore as likely to be early and integral. Eight years after the storm had scattered them, the fleet of more than a thousand ships was gathered again. But when they had all reached Aulis, the wind ceased. The prophet Calchas stated that the goddess Artemis was punishing Agamemnon for killing either a sacred deer or a deer in a sacred grove, and boasting that he was a better hunter than she. The only way to appease Artemis, he said, was to sacrifice Iphigenia, who was either the daughter of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, or of Helen and Theseus entrusted to Clytemnestra when Helen married Menelaus. Agamemnon refused, and the other commanders threatened to make Palamedes commander of the expedition. According to some versions, Agamemnon relented and performed the sacrifice, but others claim that he sacrificed a deer in her place, or that at the last moment, Artemis took pity on the girl, and took her to be a maiden in one of her temples, substituting a lamb. Hesiod says that Iphigenia became the goddess Hecate. The Achaean forces are described in detail in the Catalogue of Ships, in the second book of the Iliad. They consisted of 28 contingents from mainland Greece, the Peloponnese, the Dodecanese Islands, Crete, and Ithaca, comprising 1186 Pentecontas, ships with 50 rowers. Thucydides says that according to tradition there were about 1200 ships, and that the Boeotian ships had 120 men, while Philoctet's ships only had the fifty rowers, 
these probably being maximum and minimum. These numbers would mean a total force of 70,000 to 130,000 men. Another catalogue of ships is given by the Bibliotheca that differs somewhat but agrees in numbers. Some scholars have claimed that Homer's catalogue is an original Bronze Age document, possibly the Achaean commander's order of operations. Others believe it was a fabrication of Homer. The second book of the Iliad also lists the Trojan allies, consisting of the Trojans themselves, led by Ecto, and various allies listed as Dardanians led by Aeneas, Zelens, Adristians, Pacotians, Pelisceans, Thracians, Sicanian spearmen, Pionian archers, Halizones, Mysians, Phrygians, Meonians, Miletians, Lycians led by Sapedon and Carians. Nothing is said of the Trojan language, the Carians are specifically said to be barbarian speaking, and the allied contingents are said to have spoken many languages, requiring orders to be translated by their individual commanders. The Trojans and Achaeans in the Iliad share the same religion, same culture and the enemy heroes speak to each other in the same language, though this could be dramatic effect. Nine years of war Philoctetes Philoctetes was Heracles' friend, and because he lit Heracles's funeral pyre when no one else would, he received Heracles' bow and arrows. He sailed with seven ships full of men to the Trojan War, where he was planning on fighting for the Achaeans. They stopped either at Cry's Island for supplies, or in Tenedos, along with the rest of the fleet. Philoctetes was then bitten by a snake. The wound festered and had a foul smell. On Odysseus's advice, the Atreidae ordered Philoctetes to stay on Lemnos. Medan took control of Philoctetes's men. While landing on Tenedos, Achilles killed King Tenes, son of Apollo, despite a warning by his mother that if he did so he would be killed himself by Apollo. From Tenedos, Agamemnon sent an embassy to the preen king of Troy composed of Menelaus, Odysseus, and Palamedes, asking for Helen's return. The embassy was refused. Philoctetes stayed on Lemnos for ten years, which was a deserted island according to Sophocles' tragedy Philoctetes, but according to earlier tradition was populated by minions. Arrival Calchas had prophesied that the first Achaean to walk on land after stepping off a ship would be the first to die. Thus even the leading Greeks hesitated to land. Finally, Protesilaus, leader of the Phileasans, landed first. Odysseus had tricked him, in throwing his own shield down to land on, so that while he was first to leap off his ship, he was not the first to land on Trojan soil. Hector killed Protesilaus in single combat, though the Trojans conceded the beach. In the second wave of attacks, Achilles killed Sickness, son of Poseidon. The Trojans then fled to the safety of the walls of their city. The walls served as sturdy fortifications for defense against the Greeks. The build of the walls was so impressive that legend held that they had been built by Poseidon and Apollo during a year of forced service to Trojan King Lomedon. Protesilaus had killed many Trojans but was killed by Hector in most versions of the story, though others list Aeneas, Achets, or Phobos as his slayer. The Achaeans buried him as a god on the Thracian peninsula, across the Trode. After Protesilaus' death, his brother, Podasas, took command of his troops. The Achaeans besieged Troy for nine years. This part of the war is the least developed among surviving sources, which prefer to talk about events in the last year of the war. After the initial landing the army was gathered in its entirety again only in the tenth year. Thucydides deduces that this was due to lack of money. They raided the Trojan allies and spent time farming the Thracian peninsula. Troy was never completely besieged, thus it maintained communications with the interior of Asia Minor. Reinforcements continued to come until the very end. The Achaeans controlled only the entrance to the Dardanelles, and Troy and her allies controlled the shortest point at Abydos and Sistos and communicated with allies in Europe. Achilles and Ajax were the most active of the Achaeans, leading separate armies to raid lands of Trojan allies. According to Homer, Achilles conquered 11 cities and 12 islands. According to Apollodorus, he raided the land of Aeneas in the Troad region and stole his cattle. He also captured Lyrnesus, Pedasus, and many of the neighboring cities, and killed Troilus, son of Preen, who was still a youth, it was said that if he reached 20 years of age, Troy would not fall. According to Apollodorus, 
He also took Lesbos and Phasia, then Colophon, and Smyrna, and Clazomene, and Sine, and afterwards Aegilus and Tenus, the so-called hundred cities, then, in order, Adramitium and Side, then Endium, and Linium, and Cologne. He took also high population Thebes and Lyrnesis, and further Antindris, and many other cities. The Crids comments that the list is wrong in that it extends too far into the south. Other sources talk of Achilles taking Pedasus, Monenia, Mithemna, in Lesbos, and Pisidais. Among the loot from these cities was Briseis, from Lyrnesis, who was awarded to him, and Chrysais, from high population Thebes, who was awarded to Agamemnon. Achilles captured Lysau, son of Preen, while he was cutting branches in his father's orchards. Patroclus sold him as a slave in Lemnos, where he was bought by Ishan of Imbros and brought back to Troy. Only twelve days later Achilles slew him, after the death of Patroclus. Ajax in a game of Petia Ajax son of Telamon laid waste the Thracian peninsula of which Polymester, a son-in-law of Preen, was king. Polymester surrendered Polydorus, one of Priam's children, of whom he had custody. He then attacked the town of the Phrygian king Teleutus, killed him in single combat and carried off his daughter Tecmessa. Ajax also hunted the Trojan flocks, both on Mount Ida and in the countryside. Numerous paintings on pottery have suggested a tale not mentioned in the literary traditions. At some point in the war Achilles and Ajax were playing a board game Petia. They were absorbed in the game and oblivious to the surrounding battle. The Trojans attacked and reached the heroes, who were only saved by an intervention of Athena. Death of Palamedes Odysseus was sent to Thrace to return with grain, but came back empty-handed. When scorned by Palamedes, Odysseus challenged him to do better. Palamedes set out and returned with a shipload of grain. Odysseus had never forgiven Palamedes for threatening the life of his son. In revenge, Odysseus conceived a plot where an incriminating letter was forged, from Prim to Palamedes, and gold was planted in Palamedes' quarters. The letter and gold were discovered, and Agamemnon had Palamedes stoned to death for treason. However, Pausanias, quoting the Cypria, says that Odysseus and Diomedes drowned Palamedes while he was fishing, and Dites says that Odysseus and Diomedes lured Palamedes into a well, which they said contained gold, then stoned him to death. Palamedes' father Naulius sailed to the Trode and asked for justice, but was refused. In revenge, Naulius travelled among the Achaean kingdoms and told the wives of the kings that they were bringing Trojan concubines to dethrone them. Many of the Greek wives were persuaded to betray their husbands, most significantly Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, who was seduced by Aegisthus, son of Thyestes. Mutiny near the end of the ninth year since the landing, the Achaean army, tired from the fighting and from the lack of supplies, mutinied against their leaders and demanded to return to their homes. According to the Cypria, Achilles forced the army to stay. According to Apollodorus, Agamemnon brought the wine growers, daughters of Aeneas, son of Apollo, who had the gift of producing by touch wine, wheat, and oil from the earth, in order to relieve the supply problem of the army. Achilles, maddened with grief over the death of Patroclus, swore to kill Hector in revenge. The exact nature of Achilles' relationship to Patroclus is the subject of some debate. Although certainly very close, Achilles and Patroclus are never explicitly cast as lovers by Homer, but they were depicted as such in the archaic and classical periods of Greek literature, particularly in the works of Aeschylus, Aeschines and Plato. He was reconciled with Agamemnon and received Briseis back, untouched by Agamemnon. He received a new set of arms, forged by the god Hephaestus, and returned to the battlefield. He slaughtered many Trojans, and nearly killed Aeneas, who was saved by Poseidon. Achilles fought with the river god Scamander, and a battle of the gods followed. The Trojan army returned to the city, except for Hector, who remained outside the walls because he was tricked by Athena. Achilles killed Hector, and afterwards he dragged Hector's body from his chariot and refused to return the body to the Trojans for burial. The body nevertheless remained unscathed as it was preserved from all injury by Apollo and Aphrodite. The Achaeans then conducted funeral games for Patroclus. Afterwards, Preen came to Achilles' tent, 
guided by Hermes, and asked Achilles to return Hector's body. The armies made a temporary truce to allow the burial of the dead. The Iliad ends with the funeral of Hector. Shortly after the burial of Hector, Penthesilea, queen of the Amazons, arrived with her warriors, El Penthesilea, daughter of Otrera and Ares, had accidentally killed her sister Hippolyte. She was purified from this action by Priam, and in exchange she fought for him and killed many, including Machon, according to Pausanias, Machao was killed by Eurypylus, and according to one version, Achilles himself, who was resurrected at the request of Thetis. In another version, Penthesilea was killed by Achilles who fell in love with her beauty after her death. Thesites, a simple soldier and the ugliest Achaean, taunted Achilles over his love and gouged out Penthesilea's eyes. Achilles slew Thesites, and after a dispute sailed to Lesbos, where he was purified for his murder by Odysseus after sacrificing to Apollo, Artemis, and Leto. While they were away, Memnon of Ethiopia, son of Titunus and Eos, came with his host to help his stepbrother Priam. He did not come directly from Ethiopia, but either from Susha in Persia, conquering all the peoples in between, or from the Caucasus, leading an army of Ethiopians and Indians. Like Achilles, he wore armor made by Hephaestus. In the ensuing battle, Memnon killed Antilochus, who took one of Memnon's blows to save his father Nestor. Achilles and Memnon then fought. Zeus weighed the fate of the two heroes. The weight containing that of Memnon sank, and he was slain by Achilles. Achilles chased the Trojans to their city, which he entered. The gods, seeing that he had killed too many of their children, decided that it was his time to die. He was killed after Paris shot a poisoned arrow that was guided by Apollo. In another version he was killed by a knife to the back or healed by Paris, while marrying Polyxena, daughter of Priam, in the temple of Thimbraean Apollo, the site where he had earlier killed Troilus. Both versions conspicuously deny the killer any sort of valor, saying Achilles remained undefeated on the battlefield. His bones were mingled with those of Patroclus, and funeral games were held. Like Ajax, he is represented as living after his death in the island of Luke, at the mouth of the Danube River, where he is married to Helen. A great battle raged around the dead Achilles. Ajax held back the Trojans, while Odysseus carried the body away, Elwyn Achilles' armor was offered to the smartest warrior, the two that had saved his body came forward as competitors. Agamemnon, unwilling to undertake the invidious duty of deciding between the two competitors, referred the dispute to the decision of the Trojan prisoners, inquiring of them which of the two heroes had done most harm to the Trojans. Alternatively, the Trojans and Pallas Athena were the judges in that, following Nestor's advice, Spies were sent to the walls to overhear what was said. The girl said that Ajax was braver. For Aeus took up and carried out of the strife the hero, Peleus' son, this great Odysseus cared not to do. To this another replied by Athena's contrivance, Why, what is this you say? A thing against reason and untrue. Even a woman could carry a load once a man had put it on her shoulder, but she could not fight. For she would fail with fear if she should fight. Scoliast on Aristophanes, Knights 1056 in Aristophanes Ib. According to Pinda, the decision was made by secret ballot among the Achaeans. In all story versions, the arms were awarded to Odysseus. Driven mad with grief, Ajax desired to kill his comrades, but Athena caused him to mistake for the Achaean warriors the cattle and their herdsmen. In his frenzy he scourged two rams, believing them to be Agamemnon and Menelaus. In the morning, he came to his senses and killed himself by jumping on the sword that had been given to him by Hector, so that it pierced his armpit, his only vulnerable part, and according to an older tradition, he was killed by the Trojans who, seeing he was invulnerable, attacked him with clay until he was covered by it and could no longer move, thus dying of starvation. After the tenth year, it was prophesied that Troy could not fall without Heracles' bow, which was with Philoctetes in Lemnos. Odysseus and Diomedes retrieved Philoctetes, whose wound had healed. Philoctetes then shot and killed Paris. According to Apollodorus, Paris' brothers Helenus and Diophobus wied over the hand of Helen. Diophobus prevailed, and Helenus abandoned Troy for Mount Ida.
Calchas said that Helenus knew the prophecies concerning the fall of Troy, so Odysseus waylaid Helenus. Under coercion, Helenus told the Achaeans that they would win if they retrieved Pelops' bones, persuaded Achilles' son Neoptolemus to fight for them, and stole the Trojan Palladium. The Greeks retrieved Pelops' bones, and sent Odysseus to retrieve Neoptolemus, who was hiding from the war in King Lycomedes's court in Cyros. Odysseus gave him his father's arms. Eurypylus, son of Telephus, leading, according to Homer, a large force of Cateoi, or Hittites or Mysians according to Apollodorus, arrived to aid the Trojans. Eurypylus killed Machao and Penelios, but was slain by Neoptolemus. Disguised as a beggar, Odysseus went to spy inside Troy, but was recognized by Helen. Homesick, Helen plotted with Odysseus. Later, with Helen's help, Odysseus and Diomedes stole the Palladium. The end of the war came with one final plan. Odysseus devised a new ruse, a giant hollow wooden horse, an animal that was sacred to the Trojans. It was built by Apes and guided by Athena, from the wood of a cornel tree grove sacred to Apollo, with the inscription. The Greeks dedicate this thank offering to Athena for their return home. The hollow horse was filled with soldiers led by Odysseus. The rest of the army burned the camp and sailed for Tenedos. When the Trojans discovered that the Greeks were gone, believing the war was over, they joyfully dragged the horse inside the city, while they debated what to do with it. Some thought they ought to hurl it down from the rocks, others thought they should burn it, while others said they ought to dedicate it to Athena. Both Cassandra and Lekun warned against keeping the horse. While Cassandra had been given the gift of prophecy by Apollo, she was also cursed by Apollo never to be believed. Serpents then came out of the sea and devoured either Lekun and one of his two sons, Lekun and both his sons, or only his sons, a portent which so alarmed the followers of Aeneas that they withdrew to Ida. The Trojans decided to keep the horse and turned to a night of mad revelry and celebration. 134. Sinan, an Achaean spy, signaled the fleet stationed at Tenedos when, it was midnight and the clear moon was rising, and the soldiers from inside the horse emerged and killed the guards. The Achaeans entered the city and killed the sleeping population. A great massacre followed which continued into the day. Blood ran in torrents, drenched was all the earth, as Trojans and their alien helpers died. Here were men lying quelled by bitter death all up and down the city in their blood. The Trojans, fueled with desperation, fought back fiercely, despite being disorganized and leaderless. With the fighting at its height, some don't fall in an enemy's attire and launched surprise counterattacks in the chaotic street fighting. Other defenders hurled down roof tiles and anything else heavy down on the rampaging attackers. The outlook was grim though, and eventually the remaining defenders were destroyed along with the whole city. Neoptolemus killed Preen, who had taken refuge at the altar of Zeus of the courtyard. Menelaus killed Diophobus, Helen's husband after Paris' death, and also intended to kill Helen, but, overcome by her beauty, threw down his sword and took her to the ships. Ajax the lesser raped Cassandra on Athena's altar while she was clinging to her statue. Because of Ajax's impiety, the Achaeans, urged by Odysseus, wanted to stone him to death, but he fled to Athena's altar, and was spared. Antenna, who had given hospitality to Menelaus and Odysseus when they asked for the return of Helen, and who had advocated so, was spared, along with his family. Aeneas took his father on his back and fled, and, according to Apollodorus, was allowed to go because of his piety, help. The Greeks then burned the city and divided the spoils. Cassandra was awarded to Agamemnon. Neoptolemus got Andromache, wife of Hector, and Odysseus was given Hecuba, Priam's wife. The Achaeans threw Hector's infant son Astyons down from the walls of Troy, either out of cruelty and hate to end the royal line, and the possibility of a son's revenge. They, by usual tradition Neoptolemus also sacrificed the Trojan princess Polyxena on the grave of Achilles as demanded by his ghost, either as part of his spoil or because she had betrayed him, El. Aethra, Theseus' mother, and one of Helen's handmaids, was rescued by her grandsons, Demophon and Achamas. The historicity of the Trojan War, including whether it occurred at all and where Troy was located if it ever existed, 
is still subject to debate. Most classical Greeks thought that the war was a historical event, but many believed that the Homeric poems had exaggerated the events to suit the demands of poetry. For instance, the historian Thucydides, who is known for being critical, considers it a true event but doubts that 1,186 ships were sent to Troy. Euripides started changing Greek myths at will, including those of the Trojan War. Near year 100 AD, Dio Chrysostom argued that while the war was historical, it ended with the Trojans winning, and the Greeks attempted to hide that fact. Around 1870 it was generally agreed in Western Europe that the Trojan War had never happened and Troy never existed. Then Heinrich Schliemann popularized his excavations at Hisalik, Kanikkale, which he and others believed to be Troy, and of the Mycenaean cities of Greece. Today many scholars agree that the Trojan War is based on a historical core of a Greek expedition against the city of Troy, but few would argue that the Homeric poems faithfully represent the actual events of the war. In November 2001, geologist John C. Kraft and classicist John V. Luce presented the results of investigations into the geology of the region that had started in 1977. The geologists compared the present geology with the landscapes and coastal features described in the Iliad and other classical sources, notably Strabo's Geographia. Their conclusion was that there is regularly a consistency between the location of Troy as identified by Schliemann, and other locations such as the Greek camp, the geological evidence, and descriptions of the topography and accounts of the battle in the Iliad, although of course this could be a coincidence. In the 20th century scholars have attempted to draw conclusions based on Hittite and Egyptian texts that date to the time of the Trojan War. While they give a general description of the political situation in the region at the time, their information on whether this particular conflict took place is limited. Andrew Dalby notes that while the Trojan War most likely did take place in some form and is therefore grounded in history, its true nature is unknown. The Tavagalava letter mentions a kingdom of Ayava, Achir, or Greece that lies beyond the sea, that would be the Aegean, and controls Milivanda, which is identified with Miletus. Also mentioned in this and other letters is the Asuva confederation made of 22 cities and countries which included the city of Vilusa, Ilios or Ilion. The Milavata letter implies the city lies on the north of the Asuva confederation, beyond the Sahar river. While the identification of Vilusa with Ilium, that is, Troy, is always controversial, in the 1990s it gained majority acceptance. In the Alexandu Treaty c. 1280 BC, the king of the city is named Alexandu, and Paris's name in the Iliad, among other works, is Alexander. The Tavagalava letter, dated c. 1250 BC, which is addressed to the king of Ayava, actually says, now as we have come to an agreement on Vilusa over which we went to war. Formerly under the Hittites, the Asuva confederation defected after the battle of Kadesh between Egypt and the Hittites, c. 1274 BC. In 1230 BC Hittite king Tudhaliya IV, c. 1240 1210 BC campaigned against this federation. Under Anuvanda III, c. 1210 1205 BC, the Hittites were forced to abandon the lands they controlled in the coast of the Aegean. It is possible that the Trojan War was a conflict between the king of Ayava and the Asuva confederation. This view has been supported in that the entire war includes the landing in Mysia, and Telephus wounding, Achilles' campaigns in the North Aegean and Telamonian Ajax campaigns in Thrace and Phrygia. Most of these regions were part of Asuva. That most Achaean heroes did not return to their homes and founded colonies elsewhere was interpreted by Thucydides as being due to their long absence, El nowadays the interpretation followed by most scholars is that the Achaean leaders driven out of their lands by the turmoil at the end of the Mycenaean era preferred to claim descent from exiles of the Trojan War. Thank you, hope you find the content informative. Kindly share the video and subscribe to the channel, do comment to let us know what are the other subjects you'd like us to cover.